Hello everyone, this is Nitish from Electronics Club. I welcome you all to another episode of Industry 4.0, an initiative of Electronics Club with a vision to introduce the student community to the disciplines which form the foundation of the fourth industrial revolution, which is a revolution which will be led by us after the after graduating from IIT Kanpur. So we have Samarip Datta, final year degree, degree student in electrical engineering, and Suresh Anshinal, final year B Tech in electrical engineering on the set today. Today's post podcast is on a topic which has become a buzzword not only in the field of cellular industry but also has revolutionized the fields of autonomous vehicles and drones, industrial automation, augmented and virtual reality, uh, infrastructure for smart cities and traffic management. Yes, you guessed it right. It is none other than the 5G technology. So, Swamidip, can you give an overview of how the cellular industry has evolved over the years? Yeah, right. So, uh, well, first thing before understanding what's 5G, we need to understand what's a G or what what is it that leads to the formation of a new generation. Uh, so, with every generation, we have a shift, first of all, in the market use case, which is being catered to. And correspondingly, to be able to cater to that market use case, you also need a change in the technologies that support the the particular generation we are talking about starting with 1g 1g was the generation which first brought into uh, brought into the world the concept of wireless communication uh it 1g was entirely analog wireless communication in the sense that the entire communication happened over actual uh waves actual actual sound waves so to speak uh, however with 2g we first entered the realm of digital communications where we started working with bits, with binary data which can be processed by machines and later of course then the analog part came in but the concept of digital communications first came in with 2G and more importantly the the concept of data also came in with 2G. 2G facilitated SMS, 2G facilitated some limited amount of internet connectivity as well. Uh, with 3G we really had the first mobile broadband uh, high speed data sp with speeds high enough to even uh, watch videos on phone. So 3G brought us mobile broadband, 4G brought us even better mobile broadband in the sense that the data rates improved significantly and uh, the connection, the internet connection was much more reliable along with of course uh, the improvement in the calling experiences and uh, so with this evolution which we have had in terms of the market use cases for each of these generations there there are some bedrock technologies which have enabled the improvement in the uh, experience of the users right and now to today we have 5g why am and there is a reason why i'm saying we have 5g the 3gpp the third generation partnership project uh, 3GPP, this is an organization and it has already come up with a set of specifications as to what 5G phones or what 5G devices should have or what 5G applications should support. So 5G is a reality and 5G deployments have already begun in places of the world. Uh, so we have 5G now and like talking about 5g 5g's vision is much more broader it doesn't talk about simply broadband of course that is one use case enhanced mobile broadband which is even more data rates and even more uh, even more reliable connections but there is a lot more to it and we'll talk about it hmm. so like uh, how does a, a new standard evolve hmm. so how does a new standard evolve in the sense that there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of steps between the de the development of technology and it's coming into the market. So first of all, of course, the academia, academia and industry research lab they work on technologies and they suggest improvements. They suggest some uh, some changes and uh, whatsoever. So that research, before it comes into industry, before it's actually deployed on uh, devices, it has to go through a process known as standardization. So, uh, so once that technology has been tested by the industries, by whichever industry or whichever uh, organization is pushing pushing it, then they need to uh, pitch it to a body called 
International Telecommunications Union uh, or ITU, which is a body of the United Nations. Now, that body comprises uh, a sub-body known as the Third Generation Partnership Project as of now, which is 3GPP. And it also uh, com comprises some industry operators and representatives, right? Now, talking about third generation partnership project, it comprises uh, standard development organizations of various countries and uh, regional associations. Uh, now, where does India come into the picture here? So, up till 4G, up till the time when 4G standards were developed, India was not in the picture of developing telecom standards. There were standard development organizations or STOs of Europe, uh, North America, Japan, and uh, China and uh, I guess uh, and South Korea. So India wasn't in the picture and uh, so what happened earlier was that technologies made by foreign countries or the, the standards specified by other standard development organizations had to be compulsorily adopted uh, so that uh, f by Indian vendors. So India specific uh, requirements couldn't make it to the standards and hence the in i think then the telecom standards development society of india tsdsi was set up with our iit kanpur's director dr abhay karandikar as a founding director of the organization and after the establishment of tsdsi india also started attending the world meetings where standards are specified and cont and indian specifications indian demands were pushed through into the standards that were written for 5g so uh so that, so that is that is where and once things are written in the standard and then the industrial deployments will have to abide by the standards and that's how the process is completed so um you talked about indian requirements being mm -hmm. put in the world stage so what are some specific uh, requirements that indian uh, economy has india has that haven't been properly represented as of yet um, I am not an expert on that, but the one thing which I remember was mentioned in one of the lectures I attended was that uh, the very way a village was conceptualized by European and like the standard makers was that a village is a place where there is very little user density because houses are very sparsely s spaced out. And uh, that clearly doesn't hold for India because like I in the US you can imagine a village with you know, large farms and everything but in India you have very small land holdings so actually there is a lot of uh, user density in, in Indian villages which was encountered for. Uh, another thing which was there in, uh, in abroad in villages you have vehicles with very fast mobility right you have cars you have uh, but in India you have let's say bullock carts you have tractor so I mean the mobility of users is not that high so so we are so when villages were conceptualized by them it was conceptualized as low user density high mobility while in India it is high user density low mobility and hence the environment was not properly standardized if we look at if we look at from an Indian perspective so, these kind of issues what sets 5g apart from other generations hmm. So as I was talking about, 5G has a much broader vision. It's not just about mobile users anymore. It's about uh, three different kinds of use cases, right? So there is one one part is uh, enhanced mobile broadband, which is that mobile users can get higher throughputs, more reliable data connections, etc. But there's also uh, there's also massive machine type communication, which let's say. Uh, you have an industry floor with a large number of devices communicating simultaneously uh, or uh, an intelligent kitchen, smart kitchen, where you have a large number of sensors deployed everywhere. And they are all communicating at the same time. So it 5G also caters to this kind of environments. 5G also caters to something known as ultra-reliable low-latency communications or machine-critical uh, infrastructure in the sense that where latency is a very issue, very, uh, very big issue, where you cannot delay your signals by much for example in a in a autonomous vehicles your a delay of a few seconds can prove fatal like, there can be actual accidents or when you are doing remote surgery uh, you cannot have much lags in your in your connection otherwise you know that can cause a lot of bleeding and whatever 
So what are the new technologies in 5G which, which differentiates it from 4G and other previous generations? Okay, so technologies, two key technologies come to mind. First is massive MIMO. So 4G already had MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple output, in the sense that uh, both the transmitter and the receiver can have more than one antenna. So 4G, we typically talk of, let's say, two antennas, four antennas, or up to eight antennas. What 5G talks about is massive MIMO, wherein you have a much larger number of antennas to the tune of 64 antennas, 128 antennas, or even more, uh, theoretically infinite number of antennas. Right. So that is massive MIMO. Second thing is millimeter wave. So this is a movement upwards the spectrum. So uh, now talking about it, we'll we'll elaborate on this a little later. Uh, like, but bro loosely speaking, there are two frequency segments of 5G. One is frequency range one FR1, which is sub six gigahertz, and other is FR2, frequency range two. Now, this frequency range 2, which is somewhere in between, let's say, 28 to 40 gigahertz, that is known as millimeter wave, in the sense that, uh, or MM wave in short. So, millimeter wave technology is really new, and like so a lot of things change when you move such higher, higher up in the frequencies. Uh, first of all, there is a lot. At higher the frequency, more is the dissipation in the environment, and hence blockages become critical. So let's say I am transmitting to a receiver, uh, so a user is is getting some connection from the base station, and there is a tree in between. So that tree will block the entire signal out. So blockages and uh, dissipation in the environment, multipath, all all kind of issues become critical in millimeter wave. And even in, at the circuits level, very different kind of circuits need to be designed, which can handle that kind of uh, high frequency signals, and uh, not get burnt, or so to so to say. So, uh, so th that is something definitely new in 5G. And as far as deployment is considered, uh, 5G. 5G is entirely based on small cell deployment and like there is a lot of uh, talk about small cell deployment in the sense that up to 4G we had big base stations which used to serve a large area uh, but 5G talks talks about in some sort a decentralization of the network in the sense to have smaller smaller towers serving smaller areas so depending on the size you call these cells as femto cells, pico cells, nano cells and finally, of course, uh, all of these backhaul to the macro cell, which is the larger cell we already had. So with small, the, the, the good thing about smaller base stations is you will need less power to operate them. And especially in areas with, which require very dense deployment, it's beneficial to have, you know, kind of these smaller uh, antennas to share the kind of uh, traffic density with the larger antennas. Uh, Rest, of course, you also have uh, het something known as het nets, heterogeneous networks. So as we were talking about, 5G isn't about just uh, mobile mobiles being connected to, to the, the telecommunication network. You can have uh, drones connected to it. You can have uh, vehicles connected to it. So this kind of networks where heterogeneous nature of being connected to each other. These are called heterogeneous networks and that, that's a big thing with 5G. So we are talking about uh, a vehicle communicating with uh, communicating with um, with let's say a drone uh, or a camera and all these things within the same uh, cellular network paradigm of 5G. Uh, okay, so I think Suraj will take over after this. Yeah, so another thing that differs uh, uh, obviously is the technology is the underlying uh, hard or hardware and software that is uh, being deployed so one of the major things is error correction codes so uh, what differs that differs uh, 4G from 5G so 5G uses polar codes and LDPC codes which are basically for forward error correction uh, what they do is uh, they they help us achieve near Shannon limits of uh, error correction. So these also uh, they are dependent on a various on various factors how they're chosen how they are uh, uh, implemented in the protocol itself. But uh, yes, so the uh, new protocols that are being used in 
फाइव जी आर दीज पोला कोड्स एंड एल डी पी सी कोड्स अदर दैन दैट फाइव जी हैज़ अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फीचर दैट इज यूजफुल फॉर द वेरियस काइंड ऑफ फीचर्स दैट सोमदीप सेट सच एज लो लेटेंसी कम्युनिकेशन एंड मल्टी डिवाइस कम्युनिकेशन सो ऑल दीज रिक्वायर लॉट ऑफ कस्टमाइजेशन इन द नेटवर्क इन लॉट ऑफ कस्टमाइजेशन द प्रोटोकॉल फोर जी एंड प्रीवियस जनरेशन डिड नॉट एक्चुअली अलाउ दिस and did not have a large uh, range of customization in the protocol but 5g uh, by uh, really modular mo- uh, mo- like making different modules uh, of uh, in the pipeline which are uh, all customizable by their own parameters allows us to have a greater uh, uh, breadth in the network uh, topology and how it how it looks so one of the things that you need to do to ha- achieve low latency communication is that you need to send less bits for example so the number of bits is controlled by uh, two major uh, uh, modules one is error correction and another one is rate matching mm-hmm. so what error correction does is the more redundancy you have in the data uh, the better uh, quality of data that you send but low latency uh, doesn't typically require a lot of error correction it requires you to send l- less number of bits so that you can uh, Uh, have a higher effective bandwidth of the uh, re- actual data to be sent so one of the pro- uh, one of the error correction codes that is ldpc codes and as polar codes as well have a lot of uh, customization that can be done in the number of uh, 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 bits that c- you can use for error correction for example so the number of xor bits that you can use etc and these can be uh, varied from a very large number to a very small number so if you use a very small number you can achieve a very high uh, uh, very low latency network and if you use a large number you can have a very crystal clear network with very less amount of uh, errors or uh, symbol error rate and uh, same with uh, rate matching the what the rate matching module does is it controls the number of bits that is being sent by your device so each device uh, as he said there are heterogeneous devices right so suppose a phone might have a, might be able to send a very less number of bits on the same bandwidth as compared to a base station depending on how it how much processing power it has etc etc so what the rate matching does is once the uh, once all the bits are coming as a stream it selects which bits bits to send into the air which uh, which bits to modulate so that you, your hardware can uh, achieve that bandwidth so these are some of the things that uh, 5g also provides which is not uh, available which are not available in the other uh, previous generations so you saying that the trade off would reduce the like, le- uh, yes the trade off still exists so the trade off is because it's based on the laws of physics right on mm-hmm. the laws of communication you can you cannot you can't beat channel limit but what you can do is uh, use these trade offs to effectively uh, uh, you, uh, be be you design be uh, design them customize them for different use cases yeah. so you still have the trade off mm-hmm. but uh, trade offs also depend on what uh, uh, physical conditions what uh, uh, use cases uh, you have right yeah. so these trade offs can be exploited effectively mm-hmm. so so suppose you have low latency communication mm-hmm. you have a better uh, you have a better transmitter and receiver what that does is it imp- improves your signal to noise ratio mm-hmm. so you do not need that level of error correction so mm-hmm. all these trade offs can be handled in different ways so that uh, you can exploit them to have better uh, results such as low latency or uh, multi device communication mm-hmm. So from an electronics perspective how would the design of the smartphone change well uh, the smartphone so i, I have been attend i attended a few radio frequency uh, talks rf talks so the the very uh, the very way the smartphone back in or like the portion when you open the back of the smartphone you see the electronics inside so the very way those components are arranged the slots are made will actually change so for example uh, for massive mimo you will need space enough space in the smartphone slot to place that many number of antennas uh, and uh, that itself is a design challenge as to how you design that the, in that limited space which you have uh, in a smartphone of uh, average size how do you incorporate all these different uh, antennas and uh, other signal processing devices and electronics items in the back in in that limited space you have be- besides the smartphone that in itself is a design challenge right and uh, th- that is something which is still under which is still undergoing research 
and uh, yeah it it remains to be seen so another thing i would like to add on is uh, massive um, millimeter waves right mm-hmm. so they required you to generate 60 gigahertz signal so that they can yeah. be transmitted into the air currently we have to still develop we are yet to develop uh, small ics which are capable of doing this so mm-hmm. this is one of the major challenges that uh, that the software in the, the smartphone industry still faces mm-hmm. So what do you have to comment about the backward compat- compatibility like uh, 3G and 4G are compatible with each other but uh, is 5G compatible with the previous standards? Well I guess uh, yes because 5G deployments have already happened in some places of the world and uh, one thing is for sure 4G is not going away anytime soon uh, because like first of all many places don't even have 4G yet but uh, yeah even in places with 5G deployment uh, 5G might not be as uh, cheap let's say for users as 4G currently is so now talking about 5G deployment there are two kinds of 5G deployments which are happening there is non standalone and there is standalone right so standalone deployments have the entire entire architecture which is from the users to the base station and the core network the entire part of it is written according to 5G standards however many deployments are also and actually probably most of the deployments are non standalone which is the network the core network part is still 4g but just the interaction with the user which is the physical and the mac layer that, that portion is 5g now depending on whether the user is a 5g user or a 4g user they can choose what service they want to ascribe to that doesn't change that doesn't require a change in the infrastructure as such so backward compatibility is there and it has to be there in some sense so as you said earlier that the uh, uh, cell size reduces uh, to uh, uh, to uh, the pico cell and nano cell so mm. like uh, d- does it pose any health issue as the uh, the base station would uh, be very close to the uh, mm. home so so there is a lot of debate on that and a lot of public health concern i am not sure if there is any conclusive research on this which says either this way or that way but uh from what i am aware uh, there are restrictions as to how as to the transmit power you can use for transmitting your signals and and that is limited up to a certain extent that you cannot transmit higher at this higher than this power and uh, from what i am aware that power is not high enough to even uh, penetrate your skin in some sense so uh, it probably like f- f- it most likely is not a major health hazard and since the deployments are already underway so and we can see so what major challenges the, does the 5g industry have face um well talking of the indian context like first of all i guess procurement of spectrum uh spectrum prices i mean there's been a lot of discussion on the spectrum prices at least what the indian government is proposing uh industries are finding it prohibitively expensive and uh financially also the telecom providers in india all of them i mean with the sole exception of one uh, most of them are under uh, heavy financial stress due to accumulated dues from previous uh, spectrum auctions and also an adverse supreme court judgment recently uh so uh, given this so first of all like there is a lack of availability of capital to invest in 5g and uh, there is also certain uncertainty about the kind of and worldwide all, there is this uncertainty about whether there is enough demand for 5g although 5g does not strictly depend on just user demand it also has demand from industries but there is still certain uh, struggle about that and infrastructurally also in many places 5g requires new installation of new infrastructure installation of small cells for example uh, also uh, optical fiber installations at least in 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 indian context optical fiber installations are not adequate so you just you cannot just work with base stations you also need the optical backhaul to kind of uh, take the signal from the base station to the core network so uh, there are a lot of infrastructural issues and uh, other issues uh, which are kind of uh, halting the progress of 5g so <clears throat> another major skepticism of 5g networks is a uh, blockage and propagation right mm-hmm. so how do you uh, really counter it how do you uh, make use of 5g in various uh, scenarios where uh, it isn't uh, you cannot predict what exactly is blocking the signal 
from the receiver so what if there is a house in between if the person is actually in between the um base station and uh, the device and mm-hmm. ma- many other cases where you cannot actually predict uh, mm-hmm. how you're going to route the signal uh, mm-hmm. using uh, beam forming for example mm-hmm. so what are th- are there any developments being made to uh, or are there any algorithms which handle this i am not fully aware of this but bro- broadly i am aware of something known as beam sweeping so it's not that uh, I- it's not that the 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 transmitter will beam form in one particular direction but uh, in that space in the space which it has available it divides it into sectors and uh, it kind of uh, sweeps across the three dimensional space uh, and finds which direction of the beam is providing the uh, the best kind of connectivity so so beam forming algorithms are of course these are a part of ongoing research that is something called non orthogonal mi- uh, multiple access and um, other kind of techniques which are kind of being evolved to you know, s- to support multiple users in a millimeter wave kind of scenario for example coming t- coming to your question you can have uh, multiple uh, multiple uh, base stations which are let's say communicate communicating to the same user so if one base station is blocked maybe the other one can cover for it probably but then of course this is an ongoing research and like i would welcome you to engage with faculty on this as well so i noticed a similarity in 5g and how wifi works as well so there's a lot of focus on these internet of things devices mm-hmm. and there's a there's a use of 60 gigahertz uh, frequency range mm-hmm. where the new newest wifi standard also works in Mm-hmm. So do you think there's any overlap between Wi-Fi and 5G and uh, do they have any convergence coming soon? Well, I am not an industry expert but well uh, you are right to point that out. I I did read a few articles where people are talking of convergence but well I I think that's I mean the de- the development of f- 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 the Wi-Fi standards and the development of telecom standards have happened uh, independently so to speak like they have they have had independent bodies and independent routes wifi standards are developed by ieee while 5g standards have a whole different uh, ecosystem uh these coming together well maybe yes maybe not i'm, I'm not sure so what is our th- what is the vision of the 5g testbed lab in uh, our institute our institute i think uh, our director dr uh, abhay karandekar has me- was one of the prime movers initially and uh, so that is it's not just an institute project it's a department of science and technology funded project and uh, it's to make an indigenous 5g test bed uh, and now th- this test bed will have a lot of components and there are various partners which are uh, taking responsibility of each of these individual components so you have iit delhi you have iit bombay you have iit madras you have center for the cwit center for excellence in wireless technology iit madras you have samir which works on the micro microwave regime and of course you have the lab at iit kanpur so at, at iit kanpur to the best of my knowledge we are, uh, they are designing the base station part of it they are designing the remote radio head unit and the um, baseband unit uh as far as the broad purpose is considered uh so to be able to test out your technology your innovations your tools or whatsoever is that you are developing you need a place where you can test it out you need infrastructure you need hardware on which you can test it out now uh and hence the concept of test bed Uh, a shared resource which can be used by researchers everywhere uh, as opposed to let's say uh, but on the other hand let's say if a company has its own infrastructure that will not be available for public use that would be something exclusive to the company but uh, if you have um, a, a test bed developed with the government funds that can be used by a lot of uh, players another feature of this 5g test bed that's being designed in our lab is that uh, we are uh, developing a hardware implementation so it is actually being developed on an fpga uh, using uh, zilinx fpga so one of the best features of uh, using an fpga is that you uh, get to develop parallelized algorithms uh, etc of these various pipe uh, of the various pi- pipelines that are in 
the 5G network. So uh, again, there are a lot of uh, software implementations already available. And one of the things that the lab is working on is to convert the soft, uh, software implementations into actual hardware implementations with parallelized processing and the speed ups due to being uh, parallel as well. So uh, many things like CRC uh, segment segmentation and uh, um, LDPC encoding and polar coding can be made faster using these uh, parallel implementations. Has Academia moved beyond 5G? Like, uh, has work started on 6G and uh, beyond? When, uh, from whatever conferences I have attended, 6G is still something very speculative, and then uh, there is no clear vision for 6G as yet. And like, even if it, there, of course, there is some talk as to what technologies can be part of 6G, but uh, what remains unclear is whether there is any business use case for it in the sense that whether, I mean, why will anyone need 6G? So that remains unclear. Of course, there are some technologies which uh, which are considered as fi beyond 5G technologies. For example, uh, there is something known as cell-free uh, massive MIMO, which kind of imagines the cellular network uh, without cells, like without strict boundaries between what we colloquially known as towers. Like, let's say there are multiple towers serving a particular area without really a demarcation between the areas which the individual towers serve. So that cell-free is one of beyond 5G technologies and there is uh, even incorporation of UAVs and uh, into into the telecommunication network and su such kind of things are being imagined but uh, there is also talk of terahertz communication which is moving even higher moving to even high, higher frequencies, moving to, let's say, hundreds of gigahertz, close to terahertz. So so these kind of things are being discussed. And, uh, and of course, there is, of course, the talk about incorporating more and more machine learning artificial intelligence uh, into making network-specific decisions, for example, handover. Uh, so all of these things are coming into the picture and, like, it will, of course, take a lot of time before these are realized. But what re still remains unclear is who will buy 60. So, in that sense. So, ML is another buzz uh, buzzword in the uh, community. Mm -hmm. So, uh, does uh, ML have any application in the in this 5G field? Or there, is there any intersection of these two fields? Well, machine learning, the, the I mean, from what I'm aware, machine learning is more of a tool in the sense that uh, so l let's say you have to make some network specific decisions uh, you can either do it uh, manually or using thresholds or let's say you can do it predictively so that is where machine learning can come into the picture uh, you can also think of like any problem which which cannot be solved like linearly which cannot be solved exactly which needs some kind of optim optimization uh, can easily in involve machine learning right so thank you Samvidip and Suresh uh, for sparing your time from your, from your busy schedule and uh, uh, spreading awareness about this uh, new field uh, among the students community thank you so much thank you thank you